Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Helen Blyer, and I serve as the Director of Continuing Education here at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. I'm delighted to welcome you to our 57th Annual Shaft Lecture, a series that has run continuously since 1965-66, even during a pandemic, when New Testament scholar C.F.D. Mool inaugurated the series with a presentation entitled Christ and the Critics. The lecture is named for Professor David Schaff, who taught church history at Western Theological Seminary on the north side of Pittsburgh, one of PTS's antecedent seminaries. Because of the Schaff family's connection to Youngstown, Ohio, this lecture is held annually in collaboration with our friends at First Presbyterian Church of Youngstown, Ohio, with further support from the Mahoning Valley Association of Churches. Tonight is the first of three lectures. If you are watching live, the two that will follow will be hosted on Wednesday and Thursday evenings at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time at this same Zoom link. No doubt you've all become fluent in the Zoom Room platform these days. However, as you can see, we are hosting this via Zoom webinar, which means that your interaction will be made possible by the Q&A and chat buttons at the bottom of your screen. Please use chat to offer comments, thoughts, amens, and use the Q&A to post any questions that you might have. We will have time for questions at the end, and I will be moderating that session. If you find the visual of the text in these pods distracting, you can use the button in the upper left-hand corner of the pod to close it. During each of these three lectures, Dr. Coakley, who will be introduced to you in a moment, will invite respondents to converse with her at various times during her presentation. Tonight's lecture will feature the Reverend Canon Eric McIntosh, Canon for the Beloved Community Initiative for the Episcopal Diocese of Pittsburgh, proud PTS alum from the class of 2012, and priest in charge at St. James in Penn Hills, Pennsylvania. I will now turn the virtual mic over to my colleague, Dr. Edwin Van Driel, who holds the Director's Bicentennial Chair in Theology here at PTS. He will introduce our lecture. Edwin, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blyer. Um, one of the things I had started to rely on in this, uh, this uncertain time was that Zoom would at least allow us to see one another. So it's a little unsettling to speak here into the void. But um, I want to add my uh, welcome to Dr. Blyers, both to you all and especially to our speaker tonight, Dr. Sarah Coakley. Dr. Sarah Coakley is the Norris Hulse Professor of Divinity Emerita at uh, Cambridge University. She was educated at Cambridge and Harvard. She then taught at, uh, in the United Kingdom, Lancaster and Oxford. And then in 1993, crossed the pond to this site to start teaching at Harvard Divinity School. 2007, she returned to England to take a position at Cambridge, from which she then retired in 2018. And she still holds positions as honorary professor at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and as a visiting professorial fellow at the Australian Catholic University. Dr. Coakley, however, doesn't just have a highly distinguished academic career. She is also deeply rooted and involved in the church. When she was a professor at Harvard, I was a doctoral student at Yale, and Dr. Coakley would, with some regularity, come down to Connecticut for, uh, for lectures and talks. And this was just around the time that Dr. Coakley had discerned a call to the priesthood, a call, as I got the sense from her stories, not all her colleagues at Harvard quite understood. And I remember being fascinated by her reflections on on how her relationship with her, her own work and with her students was changing as she was going through this process of discernment and ordination. How her students suddenly started to relate to her, no longer just as an academic, but as a priest who would lead them in celebrating the Eucharist. As a matter of fact, in her lecture tonight, Dr. Coakley will draw on her experiences as a student intern at one of Boston's jails. <clears throat> 
In interviews and lectures, Dr. Coakley has given witness to how her own experience of ordination and ministry and pastoral care, particularly in that jail and also in a mental hospital in England, how it changed the way that she wanted to do theology. Theology should become pastoral again, she believes, rooted in prayer and contemplation. When Dr. Coakley came to Harvard, she brought with her her family, her husband, two daughters. Her daughters went to college in this country, and then they did something what Europeans sometimes do. They married Americans, and they built a life here. And so on her retirement, Dr. Coakley and her husband came back to the States, and now they're residing in Washington, DC, where she is active in a local Episcopal church as a priest, and she continues writing her four-volume systematic theology. In fact, our shaft lectures tonight will be part of the second volume on sin and race. The first volume, uh, published a couple of years ago, was on the Trinity and sex. So with those kind of topics, I can't wait to see what she is going to make of the next two volumes. Dr. Coakley, Sarah, we're glad that you're here. Welcome. Thank you so much. Well, first, let me say how grateful um, and honored I am to the president and dean of faculty at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, um, to Edwin himself and to Helen Blyer for all the work they've put into making the Shaft Lectures possible this year in these rather unusual circumstances. And I also want to say in advance how um, energizing it's been in the last week to spend time with the three interlocutors who are going to interact with me during these lectures to break up the lectures to create a conversation within them tonight uh, first canon eric mackintosh i want to say in advance of all these lectures how grateful i am to the what they've brought to this already and will um, tonight and in the following evenings so first by way of introduction let me lay some cards boldly on the table some fundamental presumptions, you might say, about what I'm going to attempt this week. What I'm offering you is this core material from the forthcoming second volume of my systematic theology, which is devoted to a new theological analysis of sin and the fall, and its intrinsic relation, as I see it, to the contemporary malaise of what I call race, in inverted commas, slash, racism. I'll explain those scare quotes and the slash in a moment. And let me acknowledge immediately that the content of these fundamental presumptions I'm laying before you are by nature contentious and therefore, of course, open to discussion. First, the method I'm pursuing here is one familiar to at least some of you from the first volume of my systematics, God, Sexuality and the Self, a method which I defended there and which I now extend into this new analysis of sin and racism. A distinctive keynote of the method is a central focus on the prayerful activity of contemplation, founded in a silent openness to the ever new and interruptive work of the spirit. And this practice flavors, modulates and transforms, I claim, the exposition of what is already given in the classic theological authorities of scripture, tradition, and reason. Note that it does not destabilize the primary authority of scripture, but precisely creates the space, as I see it, in which scripture is heard with a fresh intensity. It also causes the category of desire, both human and divine, to become a locus of particular and fresh significance. Since no one can spend long in silent adoration without becoming aware of desire's primary significance in ourselves, how desire for God is instilled in us in the first place in this activity of prayer, how it is messily entangled with other desires, including sexual desires, and how, as I shall discuss in the second lecture this week, it has become corrupted and misaggregated through the fall. What also follows from the focus on the contemplative act by a sort of sideways move is a developing capacity to see the activity of the spirit in unexpected places, in arenas otherwise theoretically marginalized or even theologically ignored. And hence my insistence that fieldwork reportage be creatively integrated into systematic theological reflection. <clears throat> 
to investigate doctrine as found, as it were, undercover in the field, has the potential to unearth priceless buried treasure, although it takes discernment. One might call it, as I do, spiritual sensation to recognize it. Secondly, it follows from these basic methodological commitments that the difficult and contentious temp contemporary topics, such as gender, race, racism, and class, themes often clustered outside systematic theology in what may be called contextual or practical or political theology, or sometimes in theological ethics, belong, on the contrary, in my view, right in the heart of systematic theology itself. To place them elsewhere is already to imply that they don't matter in the way that the classic doctrinal loci do. To place them elsewhere is implicitly to pander, I think, to a form of identity politics in which they merely become tokens of a type, kind of pop beads of forms of oppression which we either happen to have or not. And systematic theology, in contrast, the assumption is, can go on better without them. But this is to trivialize these topics profound theological as opposed to merely social and political significance. And at the same time, I think, falsely to homogenize their particular challenges. In the first volume of my systematics, I chose to tackle the vexed issue of gender and its relation to desire, which I argued to be ontologically more fundamental than gender and to have important implications by extension for Trinitarian thinking. But in volume two, in turning to race racism, I urge that a very different set of systematic reflections within theological anthropology are forced upon us, ones no less difficult and arguably more so, but different. In part, this is because race, still in square coat, square coat, scare coats net, note is, as Willie Jennings at Yale has urged of late, I quote him, one of the most difficult areas to confront, discuss, and think through for Christians, and especially for theologians. He goes on, the central reason for our difficulty is that the Western church has yet to grasp fully its deep involvement in the formation of the modern racial condition, close quote. In short, our very notion of race is, according to Jennings, and I agree, a Christian product in this country. A product of a particular historical moment in Western early modernity and modernity. Moreover, race goes on Jennings, thus becomes almost unconsciously, I quote him again, a way of seeing the world. We're going to come back to this later when I talk about race as perceptual and epistemological. Yet it remains, Jennings urges, a wholly elusive concept too, especially for those who think it is entirely clear what it means, yet cannot, when pressed, supply any convincing definition at all. The central tragedy of the racial condition, Jennings concludes, is how it has stolen from the church its revolutionary power of belonging in Christ, close quote. That is, it has divided the world up and simultaneously somehow blinded us to the other, to each other. The reason I choose to place scare quotes around the word race then is to indicate both the severe conceptual difficulties of locating race clearly, either in biology or in mere social construction, a debate that continues to rage without resolution, and to underscore its huge normative implications as a concept. Whatever it is, race language invariably does something normative. This is an insight of Ron Mallon. And on closer inspection, what it is often doing is something racist. Hence my square, scare quotes and my slash between race and racism. And this realization therefore requires us as systematic theologians to inspect very carefully what the relation of racism to sin is. And this too, and here comes my last fundamental presupposition by way of introduction, is a connection which proves theologically crucial, but also dangerously capable of distortion and inversion, and hence its equally controversial nature. 
It is theologically crucial, I urge, because if race racism does indeed divide the world in such a way that it prevents us from seeing us as being one in Christ, so Jennings, then, as I hope to show in lecture two, it is not just one sin amongst others, but somehow intrinsic to the very nature of sin and to the unfolding logic of the original fall. Though note here that I am not, as has become fashionable of late, describing it as the original sin. But what is so disturbing is that the same story of the fall has been capable of an interpretation in Christian modernity, such that sin is, its, is itself identified with racial blackness, and thus with white projected blame of the maligned other. It becomes somewhat understandable, therefore, why discussion of racism is often now squeamishly dislocated from discussion of sin, even by Christians, as if it were merely a social or economic or political problem that could be solved by the extension of rights and the alleviation of poverty. But as Vincent Lloyd has brilliantly urged of late in his book, Black Natural Law, when black theology becomes progressively accommodated into a type of liberal rights reform, it has lost its truly theological verve. It's claim to represent a distinctive natural law of black justice, which relates precisely to the problem of sin. It follows then that for all the dangers, we must as systematic theologians reconsider race racism under the category of sin. But before I attempt to do this in detail in lecture two, I first have to do something more chastening personally. In short, I have to go to jail. For only by presenting you with some unexpected fieldwork evidences of the sort already utilized in volume one of my systematics, shall I be able to explain both how I personally began to confront my own unacknowledged whiteness problem, to use a term of James Baldwin, and how the contentious theological presumptions which I have just presented came to occupy my mind in the first place. So now, for most of the rest of this lecture today, I'm going to tell you this self-convicting story and what I see as its theological consequences, along with some necessary and chastening reflections from the hermeneutics of suspicion about my own endeavour and how it might be criticised. That by way of introduction. Now, Eric, I think, already wants to come in with a question before I go further. <laughs> Yes, hi, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be a conversation partner today. Um, it's funny uh, being, uh, of course, a black man, <laughs> but I am also an Episcopalian. And before I, I guess, want to ask any questions about this race, racism issue, I have to, well, believe it or not, surprisingly, what comes to mind, who comes to mind is, um, is Richard Hooker and the idea of uh, the stool, the mm. scripture tradition and uh, indeed reason and your, your spiritual language, your Holy Spirit language and contemplation and, and the acting or the activity of the spirit and spiritual sensation. I can't help but to ask the question, are you adding a fourth leg to the <laughs> stool? And so, um, just, I love Holy Spirit talk anyway, so I'm just so curious as to how uh, this theology uh, that we're engaging with you in relates to experience. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, I uh, have a, I'm not exactly a Methodist here. Uh, <laughs> if I were, I'd want to have that fourth leg and call it experience. But I'm more, I think I'm more deeply Hookerian because um, I want to say that the three criteria of theological truth that he names, and he names them in a very particular way, the primacy of scripture as mediated through reason in every generation. Um, and that means that tradition constitutes the, re the voices of the saints of reason in every generation. I want to take that package, but at the same time to say that the contemplative or prayerful act in which space is allowed for the interruption of the spirit 
as it were, permeates all three of those. It, uh, it changes the way that we listen to scripture. It uh, changes the way we think of reason and expands its width. It changes the way we make choices within tradition for doing our contemporary theology, um, because we're looking for how spirituality and reason and tradition have always interrelated. But the reason I don't really want to make prayer or experience a distinct fourth entity is that I think that sets off a kind of diremption between experience and the others that I want to avoid. It's rather that contemplation cuts through all the other three and changes them, which is slightly different, a slightly different um, vision of what's going on. And maybe if I go now to the jail, you'll see how that works out in one particular context. So if I may, Eric, I will continue. <laughs> So I now move into section one, into the jail, testimony from the Suffolk County House Correction in Boston. As you doubtless know, it's surprisingly difficult in this country to get into jail as a white person unless you are a criminal. Um, it actually took me a year of trying and I only managed because of the assistance of an existing jail chaplain to whom I was introduced as an intermediary. However, the opposite is manifestly not true in equal measure. Not only is it not difficult to get into a jail if you commit a crime, but the color of your skin will exponentially affect the likelihood of your being sentenced and charged in certain urban neighborhoods, even for extremely minor offenses, as is now increasingly better known. Why is this? Uh, Michelle Alexander's book, which came out 10 years after I was doing this work in the jail, The, the New Jim Crow, is uh, an astonishingly revelatory account of these reasons. The intensive and sometimes violent policing of poor urban neighborhoods, stop and search frisking of young black men in particular, the manifest dangers to society at large of urban gangs, the heightened sentencing for minor drug offenses, in such areas since the 1990s. The persistent confusion of mentally ill and indigent members of the population with criminality. And above all, the notorious three strikes laws, which began in California in 1993 and extended in due course to 24 states. Partly as a result of these laws, the United States now has approximately 25% of all the prisoners in the world in its jails and state prisons. So there are numerous examples of young black men under three strikes laws getting life sentences on their third strike for crimes as minor as stealing a pair of socks or a piece of pizza. And this often at an age in the late 20s when important recent research in the United Kingdom demonstrates that young men often start to pull out of crime spontaneously. Staggeringly, the overall United States jail and prison population increased sevenfold during the last 40 years, with a highly disproportionate number of the inmates being non-white. Indeed, it's worth underscoring the percentage of non-white citizens in jail or prison in the USA is higher than it was before the civil rights movement, a sobering fact which invites questions about the remaining impact of a slavery past or a Jim Crow past. That's the point of Michelle Alexander's book. It also witnesses to the extraordinary developments that arose only after the Civil War, as investigated recently by Khalil Muhammad in his very troubling book, The Condemnation of Blackness, which shows how there was a progressive criminalization of the young urban black male precisely in this period. It's true that in very recent years, since 2010, so that's the last decade, the overall prison population has slightly shifted downwards by about 1%, although many of the people who would have been in jail before are now under um, probationary over, um, surveillance. But there is significant variety between states on this and the flow through in jails remains extremely high in impoverished urban areas. Even for those who do get out of jail quickly, recidivism is rampant. And a study in 2009 in Boston showed that more than a third, 37% of the inmates of the Suffolk County House of Correction 
were rearranged within just eight months of release. The report on the particular Boston jail also showed that even for those who successfully qualified for halfway community projects, 64% of men and 29% of women were referred straight back to the jail. And what this proves is that whatever happens in jails and prisons by way of reform is not working with sufficient impact in terms of restoration to productive citizenship. Prisoners who come out of jail in Boston are characteristically given nothing more in their pockets than was in them when they were arrested. And it's clear that the means of halfway support are still in that city at any rate defective and underfunded. On the other hand, the cost of keeping someone in jail per annum is above $50,000, a large slice of any state's economy, yet one which is balanced to some degree against the economic benefits of dirty work done by jail prisoners, such as litter picking, road repair, and so on. In the South Boston, Roxbury area of Boston in the early 2000s, I was told that approximately half of the young male black population between the ages of 17 and 23 were at some point due to filter through the jail. Of these, a significant proportion would, at the time of incarceration, have just become fathers for the first time, thus repeating a pattern of absent or erratic fatherhood that was already well known to many of them personally in their own lives. Whilst in the jail, they would be housed in cramped cells of three in which mutual violence was taken as normative. Indeed, as I witnessed, actively manipulated in some cases by the prison officers as an implicit condoned extension of state punishment. And a disturbing amount of this violence was sexual in nature, a matter which had started to be become investigated publicly in the press in the Boston Globe at the time I was a chaplain. Now, I did not know many of these items of information I have just recited when I became an assistant chaplain at this jail in my own diaconal year of ministerial formation 2000. And I believe that a lot of American citizens did not know these facts at that time and possibly don't, but there's much even now, but there's a much greater consciousness of it as a result of journalism and investigative um, exploration. But that I did not know these facts is part of what I've been coming to terms with ever since, along with the other revelations that came to me for the first time only within the jail, which I'm now going to record. What this earlier incognizance primarily witnessed to, of course, is the astonishing capacity of a white urban culture to fail to see, to perceive, what in a way was right under our noses. And I'm going to return to this basic perceptual problem at the end of this lecture. In short, I shall be arguing that for the white middle class person, sinful race racism is in major part a code for a particular sort of epistemic, perceptual, and with that moral blockage. This is not a particularly novel insight now, but I shall seek to give it a new slant in relation to questions that chiefly concern me theologically. That is, as I've noted, contemplation and desire. Perhaps I can best range my findings in the jail under three major headings. First, the practice of silent prayer as a powerful act of personal resistance, solidarity, strange intimacy, and ascetical transformation of desire and consciousness in the jail context. Secondly, the potentially atoning effects on the body, both individual and political, of such forms of contemplative transformation. And third, the exposure of the maintenance of system, systemic racism in the jail as in some way coterminous with the punitive attempt to prevent or repress the possibility of such personal transformation. So let me look first as the practice of contemplative prayer as resistance. It might not be immediately obvious that contemplative or meditative prayer, and especially the sustained practice of silence as prayer, could affect anything positive at all in the intimidating context of a jail. Especially odd, indeed truly suspicious, you might think, 
might seem to be any imposition of learnt silence on Afro-American prisoners whose religious background in South Boston would usually be Protestant and whose natural spiritual attray, therefore both affective and vocal. Does not such apparently imposed silence represent the final accommodation to political oppression? I'm going to come back to this later in this lecture. But let me say here immediately that the context of imprisonment is, I think, all important here. Because one of the most striking features of jail life is the continuous level of overwhelming noise. Without carpets on the floor, with screams of command from the guards continuously punctuating the atmosphere, and with small three men cells as the lockers of ongoing physical tensions, arguments and assaults, there is preciously little opportunity for stillness and peace. Indeed, many men in jail find it difficult even to close their eyes in the presence of others they fear. Now, it was in these totally unpromising conditions that I was, by the way, very unexpectedly invited to teach and lead one of the silent meditation groups that met on weekdays in this particular jail and which were connected to a very interesting program of self-knowledge and violence prevention that was also offered voluntarily, it should be stressed, to inmates if they desired to take this course. Again, you might be suspicious about this kind of imposition, but this course was called Houses of Healing, and it follows a book of the same name by an Armenian Christian in Boston, Robin Kazajian. And young men in this particular institution, and indeed in many Massachusetts jails and prisons now, are regularly offered the possibility of a semester length course of classes based on this book's ideas on self knowledge, self acceptance, violence prevention. I recoiled at the thought of this in initially, but unlike many such self-help volumes, which we're all familiar from reading in airports. This book is, I think, remarkably free of the narcissistic taint of the me generation. And unlike many other violence prevention projects, this book makes it a requirement pretty early on, at an early stage of the program, that each participant learn to meditate in whatever way is appropriate to him or her, to sit in silence for a short discipline period each day, simply to endure one's inner noise, one's inner obsessions, fantasies and feelings. Now, of course, for many, this was an entirely new project, discomforting, challenging, even seemingly pointless. Yet for others, the undertaking took hold. Now this all preceded my arrival in the jail when I was actually originally meant to be teaching an education course, but at the last minute, I was asked if I would take part in this particular program. And so I found myself with an ever-changing small team, chaplains, social workers and helpers of varying Jewish, Christian or Buddhist commitment or none, fitted into the picture allowed to enter the jail for one or more sessions a week, we were each allowed and allocated an hour's time slot before early supper in the day. And men in certain sections of the jail were invited if they wished to come to the chapel for silent observance. And in my case, I was asked to provide a short preliminary teaching component on Christian silent prayer at the beginning of the hour, an arrangement which enabled the session to count for so-called good time, a minor shortening of the individual prisoner's sentences, sentence per session attended. By the end of the semester in which I offered this prayer session, something um, interesting was going on. There were, there were more people in the jail coming every day uh, to, to assist with this undertaking. And the class had grown from about 15 to over 40, giving rise to worries about overcrowding and potential violence. All the men were Afro-American or Latino, I think between the ages of 17 and about 35, with the exception of two older white men who always attended together for mutual support. 
On any given day, I reckon that about a third of the men there had become regular meditators, a third were trying tentatively to find their way into the practice, and a third were merely using the opportunity, frankly, to get out of their cells or in mass good time. Who could blame them? Of that last shifting and indeed noticeably skeptical group who weakly came, as it were, to scoff at what was going on here, um, it was always an open question whether next time they would remain to pray, as indeed some of them did. Now, I cannot say that I had any particular exportations or resolves about this undertaking before I began it. Indeed, as I say, it wasn't what I was expecting to be doing. I felt I was coming empty handed and often quite uh, querulous, afraid. And at no point did I feel that I was personally bringing any good of my own to these men. Indeed, for me, the whole experience was, as it were, stripping and chastening for me in a fairly devastating way, as I observed the conditions in the jail. But by the time my year came to an end, I had learned from the men and from the experience of the jail setting some wholly unexpected to me new lessons about the special power of mutually attentive prayer and especially the power of silent prayer in a specifically jail setting. I had learned, for instance, that shared silence in peace and solidarity in the context of a jail is possibly the most subversive act of resistance to the jail's culture of terrorization and violence that one might devise. I learned too that at least some of the men were profoundly interested, unexpectedly to me initially, in reimagining re their time as a sort of process of trial and transformation. Fumbling to find any materials from the history of Christian spirituality that might fire their imaginations, I took a, a sheet of selected sayings from the Desert Fathers, the apothegmata, that stressed the efficacy of simply remaining in one's cell as a purposive means of monastic self-knowledge. Of course, I was worried about this precisely because of its seeming mandation of the men's political powerlessness. Yet the men were as intrigued by these sayings I, as, I, as I found, as they were to learn that Christian monasticism and this kind of practice itself started in, in, in North Africa. In short, they, they saw this increasingly as a possibility for subversively reimagining their incarceration. And occasionally, as if by a miracle, the straining and sweating and shifting of a hard shared silence would transmute into a few minutes of acute and focused stillness, what Quakers call a gathered meeting. And after one such miracle, I remember a prison social worker, not a Christian who was with us that day, asked pointedly, so why is this so wonderful and so different when we do it together? And an older Afro-American prisoner spoke up and, and said, well, I've recently become a Christian, but doesn't it say somewhere in the New Testament that when two or three are gathered together, Jesus promises to be with us? And I learned that day that such scriptural texts can gain powerful new valency, not only in the prison context, but in the context of such shared silence. On another occasion, one I shall never forget, a very articulate Latino African American prisoner gave the practice a try for a whole session one day, but at the end spoke up and complained, I must be doing something wrong. All I'm getting is mental jumble. And to my delight, some of the other men immediately jumped in and replied, no, that's the way you do it. Absolutely right, just keep going. And that new prisoner came up to me privately at the end, which was one of the few moments where I was able to actually talk to the men. That's the only time it was allowed as the queue was signing on for good time that day. And they had this absolutely remarkable comment. I get it, he said. This practice is to make me patient. This is the opposite of drugs. What a wonderful remark. He didn't, of course, he didn't say, right, this is an ascetical discipline. But I think what he'd immediately grasped in its essential workings was how it worked as a practice on the fundamental apparatuses of our desires, our addictions, our urgent needs. Secondly, atoning the body 
This was interesting. There was a notable amount of interest among the men in discussing how they should sit, what their body posture should be for this practice of silence and how to keep comfortable during a significant period of such silence. Some of my inner group had found that over time the practice improved their posture. They held themselves with greater surety, dignity, serenity and straighter backs. Many who had more recently joined the group thought this rather poncy and there were some relatively good natured jibes from the neophytes about self preening and Buddhist pretensions of enlightenment. Most of the men initially got into that posture with legs loosely apart, arms splayed, head forward and down. There would be quite a lot of sighing and even some groaning. And on one of the early sessions with the men, I was suddenly reminded of Elijah's posture of despair on Mount Carmel. You remember 1 Kings 18. And of the later Christian Hesychast's imitation of this posture on Mount Athos in the practice of the Jesus prayer. The theory being that the posture expressed physically, the bringing of the mind down into the heart. The next week, therefore, I risked taking in a sheet with a copy of a medieval manuscript drawing of a hesychast praying precisely in this posture of Elijah, along with a short section from Gregory Palamas's triads on the Christological theory of the practice, the heart being the center of the self where Christ comes to take up his dwelling. So the mind has to come down into that heart. Remarkably, this uh, sheet did not get confiscated by the ever vigilant friskers at the entry to the jail. And I was really moved and astonished when, when several of the men responded with great excitement to this material out of the tradition. Surprisingly too, I met no negative suspicion from the prisoners, prisoners along the lines I was wholly familiar with amongst my critically alert students at Harvard Divinity School at the time. That is, that the practice of silence, as they saw it at the Harvard Divinity School, must surely inevitably be an invitation to being silenced. I think this was the reason why I think the men didn't make that point was not just that they were subjugated themselves, which they were, but for the reasons already adumbrated about voluntary presence and silent resistance. This practice in the jail was mostly experienced by these men as strangely empowering, as conducive to a new and unwoted agency. What ultimately surprised me more therefore and emerged from the intense and continuing interest expressed in bodily posture was the men's clear understanding of the physical and psychical changes wrought in them by the practice over time, every day for several weeks or months. There was, the, there was this personal physical change and then the personal and political potential of such changes. The body of course has its meaning both personal and political, as these men understood, and as anthropologists such as Mary Douglas so memorably, memorably have theorized in the body and society. What happens to your individual body affects the body politic. The men laughed initially at the promise in the cloud of unknowing, another sheet I smuggled in, that such practices as these would make the ugliest person magnetically attractive. But again, I noticed that my inner group of practitioners immediately and readily assented to this idea. I was left wondering by the end of my semester how not only individual bodies but the body politic could be affected by such beautifying. What if the physical poise, calm and self-control that had been gained in such miraculous moments of solidarity in jail could be maintained outside? Indeed, the most often asked question to me by the men was where they could find such a continuing group when they got out of jail in the local surroundings. Indeed, this is the tragic failure that still confronts all the good efforts and effects of such work that people do with this book, The Houses of Healing in the Boston jail system, because it's the fragile re-entry into the South Boston and Roxbury area where economic and personal support founders and this has been further uh, collaborated and, and insightfully spelled out by work done by the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Here's the fracturing moment. Uh, even if you survive jail, it's when you come out 
that uh, that things collapse again. Eric, I think this is the point you want to push back. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I want to first say, however, that it, I find it very intriguing to consider this idea of being most subversive act of resistance, mm -hmm. this prayer, and that uh, in it they could reimagine their incarceration, um, mm -hmm. even outside of jail, being a person in the oppressed group in a country. There are other forms of incarceration, and so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by this 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 idea, and maybe you should might practice it at my own church. How about that? <laughs> But um, I have to tell you that what comes to mind is a book um, by uh, Reverend Gail Fisher. Mm -hmm. She's a uh, Episcopalian, fellow Episcopalian, and she uh, has a book, Preaching Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter Jarrett Shell is one of the uh, writers uh, of an essay. And he's, he's reflecting on white fragility. Mm -hmm. and, and he says, if we do not listen, we will never know our own blind spots. And he says, if we consider this as a theological framework, what fragility represents sin's effort to remain unexamined. And so I can't help but to be suspicious as I listen also, as, as your story unfolds. It's a, it's a wonderful story, but I can't help but to ask the questions, is this work an effort to get uh, in front of your own fragility? Mm. Or are you looking... Uh, to hide behind your work with these inmates as you reflect and tell your story? Or are you celebrating a success to claim you have overcome the impact of white supremacy and privilege <laughs> in your own life? <laughs> you know, I, of course, I don't necessarily want you to answer all those questions. Those come to me. But I, I am curious as to how does fragility factor into this narrative of contemplative prayer and mm -hmm. atoning the body? Because I'm especially interested in this atoning the body. But I want to get past my suspicion that something about white fragility is going on here. Of course it is. How could it not be? Um, right fragility, of course, has become um, a code word, D'Angelo's book and so on, for um, a particular state of the whiteness problem, which, um, <clears throat> which um, even if it is rather self-righteously self-flagellating, which is rather a popular form of um, behavior in white Episcopalianism, <laughs> um, as I'm sure you'll agree, is at the same time defending itself, all right? And so what you're rightly asking, and I'm going to do a bit more self-critique before we've quite finished here, but, um, but, what, but what, what you're rightly asking is, was I unconsciously defending myself through this, as it were, commodified form of um, imposition of a, of a kind of silence on these subjugated black bodies, um, so that the story becomes actually a justificatory story of the status quo, as opposed to a transformative story. Sure. Um, and you know, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I can I can say truthfully that the, the experience was uh, not only surprising, but actually quite devastating for me. Um, and hence it becomes my story of, of a fracturing of fragility, at least at one level. Um, I, I didn't come out feeling that I had either taken something to those men that would, that would as a, in virtue of my of my ministry transform them. I felt that I didn't give this to them. <laughs> I felt it was given by the Holy Spirit and by a set of very, rather unusual, you know, um, serendipitous um, uh, occurrences. Um, what I did feel was that it wasn't just me who was being changed in a discomforting way, but that I feel that I rightly witnessed a change happening in these men that was not because of me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that was wondrous to behold. And one of the manifestations of that was that there was one of the white guards who was very different from the others. A lot of the guards there were quite manifestly serious alcoholics and very burly and they were kind of drinking under the bench. 
but there was one young man who was obviously much more um, uh, kind of liberally inclined and he would come by every every afternoon I was there and look through the picture window to see if I was all right because he knew these men <laughs> and he, he knew each, each and every one of them and he knew what what they got up to right and he knew how when they were put together in these devastating circumstances in which it was well known that they would assault each other what happened and you could see his mouth just kind of dropping open <laughs> that you know whatever it was it wasn't me but whatever it was was creating these circumstances in which they were eerily peaceful and uh there was something lovely about that and it was so powerful um so i plead guilty to the white fragility charge i don't see how i can do anything else um but uh perhaps you can help me at the end to see where we go from that and when i said a bit more about my own criticisms of this undertaking because you don't teach at the harvard divinity school without becoming extremely well versed in the hermeneutics of suspicion i can tell you <laughs> um, shall i carry shall i carry on <laughs> thank you so much yes so this is the last little section about um systemic racism and what i call repressed contemplative darkness a relation where we get to the heart of a very sort of complex nexus of different kinds of darkness which are symbolically interrelating in the story as I see it. So here we arrive at what I see as my third and crucial point tonight, one which only dawned on me as the long winter semester wore on. As in the case of the fieldwork adventures which I describe in God's Sexuality in the Self, so here, but this quite time quite accidentally and providentially, I learned out of the buried treasure of faith practiced in extremis in the jail lessons both theological and philosophical in relation to the doctrine of the human self that I could never have garnered, I believe, in any other way. I can only say first that this encounter with young Boston prisoners caused scales to fall from my eyes as far as the maintenance in this country of so-called systemic racism is concerned. Because what I had vaguely known notionally but had never properly taken in, I now saw with my own eyes. As already mentioned, up to half of the young non-white male population of the area surrounding the jail would pass through this correctional institution, mostly for minor offenses with the upper limit of a 30 month sentence. But within the jail, these prisoners would experience significant levels of intentional brutalizing violence from the guards and more especially from each other. The latter often of a sexual nature and a high incidence of accompanying despair, mental illness, degradation, further criminalization. Whilst doing their time, they would also be indirectly contributing to the Boston economy, see how the system works, by engaging in low paid manual work, both inside and outside the jail. Yet on leaving the jail, they would have no money and little chance of a job. Their future lives, to say the least, had little prospect of worldly success or even respectability. Yet many already had important responsibilities to wives, girlfriends, and small children. The temptation to return to the drug scene, gang life, thieving, or other criminal activity would for many prove predictably overwhelming. And as I began to see this, and to see that the war on drugs was actually a racialized war, one of the best kept secrets of this period, and I saw too the effects on at least some of them of the regular practice of meditation. I made a connection as a theologian, speculative to be sure, that I'd certainly not seen to before. It occurred to me that if it is correct, as scholars of Kant and others have shown, that it was specifically the Enlightenment period that created a distinctively modern Western category of race, Immanuel Kant, for instance, divided white from Negro and from what he called Kalmukian and Hindustani and subordinated the darker to the lighter through appeals to different germs and predispositions. So this is a sort of early scientific, um, you know, characterization of the subordinations of race. So if it was that period that produced that modern view, 
It was also, interestingly, the Enlightenment period that effectively, at least in Kant's philosophy, repressed the epistemological and religious significance of dark contemplation in the mystical theology tradition of pre-modern spiritual writers. Whereas the influence of great mystical theologians such as, for instance, Dionysius the Areopagite had been hugely significant in the medieval and early modern Catholic thought of Western Christianity, dark contemplation being seen there as supremely and personal transformative because it led you into a kind of unknowing in which God could transform you directly. The secularized philosophy of Kant in comparison and contrast relegated to the unavailable realm of what Kant called the noumenal, whatever was dark to the organizing intellect. And indeed, uh, got rid of any reference to prayerful contemplation as a profound exercise of noetic or moral transformation. So I don't think it's a coincidence that Kant helped to, as it were, produce the modern category of, of racial subordination under a kind of quasi new scientific guise. And at the same time, refused the idea that God was available most supremely in darkness. The symbolic enlightenment connection between race and, as it were, disempowered darkness, the noumenal darkness, which was a place you couldn't go, seems suddenly theologically and politically important to me, as I was striving away in the jail with these young black men. This collocation of ideas gave me a key to understanding why this particular practice of silent solidarity might have deep political as well as personal effects. Because in it, there was this unleashing of unknowing, unknowing relation to subversive divine power as an antidote to racist despair, marginalization and repression. And this was symbolically encoded in this practice. At the same time, I realized the practice was also morally and strategically transformative for another reason, especially when undertaken interracially and with others who were not necessarily or not at all one's friends, because the unwoted peace, intimacy and solidarity it seemed to engender without questions and without rejoinders had the power over time to begin to release the societal oppressor on the one hand from unacknowledged perceptual blindness about the stranger other on the other hand, and to engender some kind of new agency and poise in the oppressed on the other. Ironically, of course, the birth of the modern prison system in Europe and America, another product of the Enlightenment period, was predicated on the possibility of penitential reformation. The idea is you went to jail to get better. But this was something of which the postmodern system of punitive policing and imprisoning of large segments of the non-white population had effectively despaired of and given up on. And so it was just this strange little band of chaplains, social workers, volunteers in this institution traditionally called correction, who refused to give up hope of change in the face of terrible political odds. The system was indeed totalizing. But I thought what it had been shown in these undertakings was that it had at least some chinks in its armor. So Eric, I think you want to come in again on these different kinds of darkness, right? <laughs> I absolutely do. <laughs> and I am so hoping that you redeem this darkness for us. Uh, I, it's something this morning in the morning prayer, uh, we read out of Joel. And uh, the, Joel, I guess it's uh, chapter two, verse one, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, mm -hmm. like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes, like there has never been from old nor will again after them in ages to come. Mm -hmm. And when I read the Bible and see moments like this scream out to me about darkness mm -hmm. and blackness 
and I want so desperately to separate the terror and trembling that comes with wearing darkness and wearing blackness every day. Mm. And, and, and so I'm just, yeah, I, I don't even know necessarily, I guess, where to go with that, except just how do we do that? How do we separate? Um, and, and it may be a tough question since you don't know what it is to be black, but mm, mm. you know, I, 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 will, I guess I just want to say once again, I hope you can redeem that for us. It's something that is <laughs> tangible and on the ground. That's a big ask. What, what I'm trying yes. to explore just initially here, and it's going to really run through the other two lectures is, I think we're dealing with three different kinds of darkness, which need, first of all, disambiguating. And then we have the big question of how on earth are we going to see how they're related? Because there is a big push in certain kinds of liberal thinking, both black and white, to repress the biblical language of darkness as sin, um, because it has been so fatally, um, confused with racial darkness and then become part of the projection of sin onto the black person, right? This is the key question which I'm going to attack tomorrow. But there's a third kind of darkness, and this is the third kind of darkness that is also in the Bible and is so strong in the mystical and contemplative traditions. And the question is, can it disturb and transform that other problematic nexus? And that's the, the darkness of God's mysterious revelatory presence. Um, uh, as a psalmist says, he makes darkness his secret place. The mystics yeah. love that, you know, or in Psalm 139, you know, the darkness and light are all alike to thee. So whatever God's darkness yeah. is, it's also his revelatory brightness. Yeah. And this links too with the wonderful theme in the Song of Songs of you are dark and beautiful, you know. So the, the mystic tradition sees darkness as the place of transformation of beauty, um, of divine um, presence. Um, I like what you said, that <laughs> God is available in darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I want to... I'm going to continue to explore that thought in my. But there is a real, there's a real, I think, division in black theological thinking at the moment about whether um, uh, whether the only answer here, which would unfortunately cause just huge tracts of the Bible to be uh, erased, you know, uh, yeah. um, whether the only answer is, is to dispose of the idea of sin as darkness because of its historic connection with racialization and abuse. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna answer that tonight. I'm gonna, well, I'd like, you know, at the end, I'd like what, to know what other people think, including you. But I think you'll, you'll see, I'm, I'm trying to, to reconfigure that in some new way by this reference to contemplative darkness. Um, sure. yeah. and, and what the men in the jail perceived that to mean for their own selfhood in which they were absorbing the hatred of the white systemic tradition. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. shall, I, shall I race to the end and then you can come yeah. back? Is that all right? <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I, um, I want to say three things against myself and then I want to close. And these three things that I'm saying against myself in the longer text, I do have some answers to, but for now, just for the sake of keeping people hopping into tomorrow and the next day, I am simply going to say them against myself. Um, and these are three kind of hermeneutics of suspicion points. Um, and the first is that, isn't there a grave danger in the line I've been exploring through this narrative of the jail of simply re-summoning um, an idea, um, an alarming idea, which is well known in the black theological literature um, of uh, uh, 
black subjects finding themselves being asked to reinscribe spiritual states of slavery within themselves by a white systemic culture. For instance, Orlando Patterson has analyzed Pauline themes of internal disor disorder a la Roman seven in slave narratives um, uh, from before emancipation. And then the reinscription of that sense of slavery to sin in spiritual forms of kind of spiritual self-flagellation even after emancipation, so called. So here's one problem that raises its head um, when the call to, um, as it were, self-examination and going inside one's own selfhood in forms of contemplation is being appealed to. Um, a second problem, I think, um, can be found in um, uh, a rather more complicated um, analysis of how desire features in contemplation, something on which I've written a lot, because I've often stressed that in the activity in contemplation over time, desires are sorted and one's desire for God is brought into connection with one's other desires, one desires, one's sexual desires, one desires for power, for recognition, for adulation, and so on and so forth. And um, there is a, a grave danger, I think, when this set of themes is racialized in some sense, that <clears throat> the idea of erotic desire in its relationship to desire for God can become, um, as it were, itself abused in a racialized situation, such that the black body or the black body in contemplation can become, as it were, erotically um, desirable, whilst at the same time also re-subjugated. And I've had some uh, black critics say that this story of the subjugated black bodies in the jail, when aligned with uh, the activity, the desiring activity of contemplation, is again just serving some function in my white psyche, um, as Eric has already suggested. And then um, a third critique is um, more philosophical and historical, and it's one that I'm going to take up as I go forward in the other two lectures. And it's, it's really, uh, I'm following here, very important work by Willie Jennings and J. Cameron Carter, who were formerly colleagues at Duke, um, in which they have uh, drawn attention to the fact that it is the Christian imagination in this country that produced its own racist manifestation, its diseased social imagination, as Jennings likes to put it. And so the potential critique of contemplation in the jail on this perspective, which actually I share, would be that it might just recap recapitulate some kind of racially constructed form of submission within the jail context which is already written, as we've seen, into the central philosophical text of European modernity. And instead of becoming a means of resistance and transformation, would merely be uh, another means of policing and subjugating um, um, and of undermining um, uh, those prisoners' capacity to push back against a racialized Christian heritage. So. Those are three hermeneutically suspicious thoughts, which I constantly worry about in relation to my own story here, and which I'm kind of asking help for in the conversation about how I could myself respond to them. But meanwhile, I just want to finish with a closing paragraph, which will tee me up for tomorrow. Um, and this will only take a minute. So let me come to these conclusions at the end of this first Schaaf lecture, precisely in the face of these challenges that Eric has raised and I've raised against myself. I hypothesized earlier in this lecture that race racism, as I called it, qua unacknowledged sin, becomes a problem of seeing, an epistemic blockage originating from the side of the oppressor 
but potentially insinuated from there dialectically also into the consciousness of the oppressed. As we begin to understand more about early modern and modern constructions of this notion of race, so we are forced into profoundly difficult theoretic territory about the potential for transforming what is by now so deeply inscribed. How, for instance, we are going to distinguish between different notions of darkness in our culture, noetic, moral, so-called racial, and then divine darkness, and how precisely they interact with each other. Further, when we return to consider the notion of sin, as I'm going to do tomorrow in my lecture then, we confront a yet further paradox. While a strong case can be made for insisting that sin is an irreducible theological category, not straightforwardly replaceable, that is, by secular categories such as economic deprivation, addiction, violence, the unconscious id, or recidivist criminality. Race racism, as we've seen this evening, still remains a kind of mystery card, so profoundly attached in white cultural imagination to a set of irresolvable social problems that it itself insidiously, insidiously sticks to the equally irresolvable theological question of what exactly sin is. Coming from the jail then, I have a profound challenge for myself. How can I untangle all these associations? And how can the practices of attention that seem so promisingly to, to, to promote and enact that untangling be taken forward into a more systematic account of Christian salvation whilst evading these big theoretic challenges that I have myself identified. And to those issues, I'm going to return in my remaining two lectures. So thank you so much for your attention this evening. Eric, did you have any last comments to make before we turn to the Q&A pod? Uh, sure, um, maybe it will stay a, a comment as opposed to a question, mm. but uh, I, I have to admit that um, silence is not something that I fully appreciate. <laughs> um, the, the silence is at church. I want at least music to be playing. <laughs> but, um, but the silence thing, and you talk about jail, and I'm reminded of uh, Martin Luther King and his letter uh from the birmingham jail yeah, and, and yeah. birmingham jail yes and he um he spoke and criticized his white uh clergy friends mm. for being silent mm. Mm. and when we speak now about this uh contemplative prayer and the silencing of the inmates in jail and it being brought to them by the system mm. it makes me still suspicious that the system and the institution of uh, mass incarceration is, if nothing else, looking to silence mm -hmm. when perhaps this is very much an environment where uh, silence is just not, I don't know. It's amazing to me that silence can be healing. And so uh, I, I wonder if it's my sensibilities of not being in jail to wrestle with that versus one who is inside but mm -hmm. this makes me a little curious as to who decided that this silence thing was good for the inmates <laughs> and who was it good for truly uh, yeah. sure. because after all uh, the recidivism rates i don't think are going down yeah. and or i don't know that other jails are taking this on in their own places i don't know it's a question that I will continue to ask and perhaps research. But thank you so much. And, I, and I'm so happy to have been uh, your conversation partner today. Thank you, uh, Eric. God bless you in this work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you want me to try and answer that one very briefly or not? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this is a criticism that is made constantly to my theology of contemplation, regardless of whether I'm talking about race and racism. Um, and as a feminist, what I always respond is that the test of true contemplation is whether it gives you courage to speak. 
All right. So it's the it's the fruits of the outcome that are important. Now, what you rightly say is, oh dear, you know, the the jailers were very surprised and a bit kind of destabilized when they saw these guys sitting there in peace. It made them a bit nervous. But on the whole, they preferred that than them acting out, right? And so you could say it played into the jail culture quite nicely. Um, the, fruit, the fruits issue is the more important one, I think, because you know, the system was so powerful that there was, it didn't seem that whatever they learned there helped them enough in terms of overcoming the economic deprivation of leaving jail with nothing in your pocket. Right? So, and I can't tell whether it helped them individually in terms of, you know, voicing prophetically what they needed to say in other contexts. But um, that's theoretically what I want to argue this practice does. And we can look to people like um, Merton and um, Gandhi and Bonhoeffer and others who also propound the importance of these kinds of practices for the courage that evidently this kind of practice gave that. So that's as far as I can get today, I think. <laughs> I, I can say, however, that I, I can imagine, I actually can imagine that the atoning of the body is something achievable uh, with this kind of practice, given mm. all of the structures and systems that keep us powerless. Mm. And that this is a moment where we can find not only God and the activity of the Holy Spirit, but a sense of power in our weakness. And so I appreciate that from you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just, I cannot, I cannot say how much I agree with you <laughs> that the evidences are not good here, right? Yeah. The system is so powerful. Um, yeah. And so it's how to enable the chinks in the armor, as I've put it. Yeah. Um, Amen. Well, thank you. I guess we're going to open it to the yeah. Everyone we have else. a number of questions, um, and just in in reflection on um, what you were you were talking about, Eric, mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the role that Howard Thurman played in being a spiritual advisor to King and others in the civil rights Certainly. Um, yeah. mysticism that was rooted in contemplative silence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know I love Howard Thurman, and so yes, I love Howard I Thurman. Love. Yes, I do. So, <laughs> yes. Um, we have a number of questions here clustering around a couple of different areas. Um, <laughs> one set of questions was focusing, of course, on the, the categories of darkness that you're talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and the role of the enlightenment mm -hmm. in proliferating issues of scientific racism, even having the word light. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and what are the antecedents to the Enlightenment in medieval and pre-modern Christianity, and what role did that play in the establishment of bad darkness, which mm. seems to be contrary to the notion of God creating both light and dark and bestowing goodness on all creation? Right. I mean, this is a huge genealogical question. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to solve it right here, but I think there's no doubt that um, uh, that the uh, European Enlightenment chose that chose that word to um, to express what it was trying to do for 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 Western culture, that it was bringing people not so much out of sin but out of ignorance. So it was darkness as <clears throat> ignorance and what Kant called heteronomy. This is what's so ironic that you know his enemy was subjugation, right? Mm -hmm. His enemy was subjugation. His his um, his intentions was to bring everybody to autonomy, um, to true freedom. Um, and he would make remarks about how it would take perhaps five hundred years for women to get there. In his famous text, "What Is Enlightenment?" Um, um, but at the same time, he was creating this other story in his anthropology about race. 
-hmm. And so it's the, it's the uh, linguistic and semantic paradoxes of, of the enlightenment. We, we, we're only beginning now, I think, to, to, to read these uh, more neglected texts of people like Kant and Edmund Burke um, looking for the language of darkness. And it's, it's enormously interesting. A lot of it is a little bit unconscious, um, but it's what's missing is that extraordinary tradition of, um, you might say, founded by the pseudo Dionysius in the fifth century of um, the true revelatory presence of God being found in this deeper darkness of mystical transformation. And that, <clears throat> that gets pushes to the, pushed to the edges at this point. Um, um, to the extent it remains, it remains as a notion of nescience rather than alluring, alluring mystery. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we can't say that we know anything about God at all, according to Kant. He's outside the realm of knowledge. We can hypothesize him as a moral, um, uh, as, 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 as that which guarantees the moral law. And that shift is so huge in Western consciousness. Um, but we don't normally think about it. We don't teach that shift as related to race. <laughs> Which you will be, you'll be addressing the other two forms of darkness in the, the subsequent two lectures. Absolutely, I will. And I don't, as I said to Eric, I, my underlying hope here is to reactivate the biblical and contemplative traditions of divine dazzling darkness <laughs> as that which defeats and transforms the darkness of sin and ignorance. Um, because if that's the case, it changes the triangulation mm -hmm. of racial, sinful and divine darknesses. Um, but this is controversial. <laughs> A number of people were interested in further problematizing your identity as a white woman mm -hmm. into this, this jail context. Um, one person asked, how has your identity as a white woman affected your ability to engage with and minister in the jail, given that society often goes out of its way to protect white women in particular from the men you intentionally sought out, including histories like what happened to Emmett Till? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was deeply aware of all this. How could I not be um, in this jail setting? And I was, um, I was certainly nervous about it. I'd already been trained rather carefully in a, in a mental hospital setting mm -hmm. um, to be cautious about where I position myself in relation to the exit door. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, I uh, what was now? Whether it was just luck, I don't know. But um, I, I, I didn't experience any actual moments of fear or concern um, throughout this whole time. Um, and I, I, I can't quite say why, why that was. Why that was. But I think it was something to do with the fact that um, most of these men were young enough to be my sons, maybe. That was a sort of an element of it, because they would often turn to me in the period when we were allowed to talk a little bit, when I found out a bit more about them, because we weren't really meant to have those conversations. And just, you know, tell me how they were, how they were feeling, you know, if they weren't feeling well or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was interesting and perhaps surprising. Um, but I think the way, the way that kind of positioning happens in certain contexts in jails is, is, is a little different than you might expect. That was what, what I experienced. I'm not sure I'm answering that person's question as that person Well, what's interesting wants. about the question, I think, in invoking the name of Emmett Till is that it actually flips the fear and power equation. Yeah. You are actually a greater threat to them than they are to you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, who was threatening whom? Um, you see, 
we had a shared threat, actually. And that's, that was the power system outside the door. This is what's so tremendously interesting about this practice, that it, it tipped up the usual side of teacher-pupil power negotiation that would normally be assumed, you know, as part of what the system brought in. Mm -hmm. But actually, for all of us, the enemy was the, was the threat of violence that was just outside that door. Another person speculated that the reason this kind of silence was empowering rather than subjugating is it because it began to create a space in which the incarcerated men could disentangle um, their own uh, internalization of darkness mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. as, as racially charged from their own understanding of self as they encountered some sense of the divine and the contemplative act. Well, I would like to say that, but of course, one of the problems here, and it's a, it's a great drawback of what I'm able to say, is that I wasn't really allowed to talk to them. <laughs> now, I mean, I, 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 I didn't say this, but maybe people who've worked in jails probably know that you have, if you go in to do anything of a chaplaincy nature, you have to sign all these documents about what you're not allowed to talk about. Mm -hmm. And indeed, um, I mean, there was very little I could say whatsoever and everything I took in was frisked and examined. And so, I mean, I was, and at one, one evening I was actually imprisoned for three hours for, um, and not allowed to even phone my husband to say where I was because of a minor infringement of, of some, well, actually it's, it's a funny story because it was all a mistake, but, but, you know, I, I, I was treated predominantly as a dangerous presence um, to the other, to the jailers. Fascinating. So there were, there were strange and unusual power dynamics going on that I probably ought to explain more in the narrative because otherwise the presumptions about this are very understandable, but they weren't actually what you might think. And that last question, I hope that was true for some of these young men, and I think it was, but especially the one who told me about this is the opposite of drugs, because I thought that was really amazing. Um, but I wish I knew more about it, and I wasn't really able to probe. A number of people are interested in this notion of fragility. Um, mm -hmm. And one of our, our question askers uh, connected this notion of fragility, not just white fragility, mm -hmm the practice of quietude as people begin to uh, be challenged by a sense of the abyss within themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She writes, this is one of the reasons why hesychasm is usually done with the spiritual father and mother to help us hold things together mm. when glimpse are on lack of being or fragility. Did you experience any of these difficulties? Absolutely. Yes, that's an extremely mm -hmm. good question. By the way, I'm looking at all these questions. They're wonderful. Um, yes. That's an extremely good question, and it's, as I'm sure the questioner also knows, um, because it's so dangerous for people who've just forcibly come off drugs that they can <clears throat> easily slide into psychosis, there is also a greater danger in this kind of practice for those who might be on the edge of a psychotic breakdown. If they've been in what's called the hole, um, if they're put in solitary, a lot of them break down. Mm -hmm. So um, I, was, I was very aware of those potential dangers and I did actually talk about it a bit. Um, I did mention that there could be some, some, some concern about that. Um, and uh, on one, one or two occasions we did discuss that. Um, I think it, 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 to a large extent it solved itself because I think the men who really couldn't bear just didn't come, all right? Because um, this wasn't an enforced activity. Um, but um, but I also think that one of the one of the features of the teaching element was that one was able to um, place a little bit of teaching about these dangers in front of people. Um, I didn't go into that very much tonight, but. Um, uh, because descending into this abyss too quickly can have 
disturbing features for sure. Would you like to give a short preview of what the next two lectures are? <laughs> All right, certainly. Thing, and then we'll Thank wrap you. it up. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Well, tomorrow I'm going to go back into Genesis 3 and um, uh, explore how incredibly ambiguous the story of the fall is um, in, within Christianity. We're so brought up on Augustine, we think we know what it means, but actually it's unbelievably, interestingly, um, uh, difficult to say exactly what it means. Um, um, however, unfortunately, there is um, one uh, tradition of interpreting it in the late 19th and early 20th century in America, which has been forgotten, which is a specifically racist interpretation of it, which I think is still in the psyche of, of America, I suspect. Also tomorrow, it's interesting you mentioned Howard Thurman because Howard Thurman appears as, as the hero of the story here tomorrow um, in, terms, in, terms of, in terms of his understanding of Augustinian rendition of sin and the response to it in activities of self-examination and meditation. And then the third lecture is a bit surprising perhaps, but it's all about the, the Carmelites, uh, Teresa and John of the Cross in the early modern period and how I think what they had to say about class and inner darkness and inner transformation and sin and contemplation has um, extraordinarily important implications for this whole problem of different types of darkness and how we are to both disambiguate them and then re-relate them. Um, so they're my resourcement um, friends along with Thurman for this issue of how contemplation intersects with the sin of racism. Thank you so much for a provocative and rich evening. Uh, I hope you have a chance to look through the chat so you can see the remarkable comments that people have been making. Um, to our participants, please note that a recording of this lecture will be made available early next week and will be posted on the PTS YouTube channel. We invite you to use the handouts that accompany this lecture and consider organizing a watch party or an education session in your community. And if you're interested in further resources on racism in the church, please take note of our closing slide. Uh, which is coming up right now, which lists other PTS materials available and other upcoming events, including a February Bible study with the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign and executive director of the Kairos Center. She'll be exploring the dangerous texts that allow us to continue to accept the presence of poverty in the world. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening with us at this same link at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Until then, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.